The scripture portion for today's service is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 14 to 15. Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 14 to 15. This is the New International Version. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Here ends the reading of the word. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist, Kongzi Fachai. I hope I said it, pronounced it correctly. Friends, it's good to see each and every one of you. I thought many will, will be um, at home today with the, with the late night reunion dinner ending yesterday, and so it will be few. But it's so encouraging to see many of you here today this morning. I think you all deserve a round of applause for yourselves. It's good to see you all. Friends, this morning I'm going to share with you on a topic that is crucial and deep because it deals with the very core of our inner being. I'm going to talk to you about an area of our life that we seldom want to address or deal with. And sometimes we will live in denial, saying that it is not an issue, it is not a problem. The reason we do not want to deal with this issue, with this problem, is because it is to do with our pride. It is to do with our dented ego. And so very often, we would pretend that it does not bother us and we choose to ignore it. Ignore it. But deep down, it is hurting us because it remains an unresolved issue from the past or even from the present that is affecting our present and will definitely affect our future, especially our spiritual well-being, our relationship with one another and our relationship with God. My friends, this morning, I'm talking about dealing with the issue of unforgiveness bitterness, unable to forgive those who have hurt us and who are still constantly hurting us. You know, there are people who are still a pain in our life and causing misery and abusing us verbally, physically. Before I move on further, let's bow our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Friends, as your eyes are closed, those of you who are seated here and those who are watching us live at this time or later on YouTube, as your eyes are closed at this moment, we are in the presence of a holy and living God, a loving God, our God, our Father. I want you to bring before your eyes, I want you to bring into your mind those who have hurt you, people who have betrayed you. It is hard. But if you want God to resolve this issue and you want God to deal in this area of our life, then try to bring to your memory people who have intentionally caused you harm. Maybe people who have assassinated your character on social media, said nasty things about you. Bring to your mind all those who have hurt you, who have caused you pain and misery. Maybe not only hurt you, but also your family members, your loved ones. Almost every one of us seated here have friends, work colleagues, siblings, parents, or other people whom we hate or resigned, or we resent. Bring them into our mind at this time. Father, we come before your holy presence. We know, Lord, in your presence there's healing, there is restoration, there is reconciliation. And we cannot move on, Lord, when we have bitterness and unforgiveness, resentment in our life. Lord, I pray for myself and I pray for my beloved congregation here today. 
Father, I pray at this time that you will open our hearts and minds and you will speak to us. You will help us to forgive those who have hurt us, those who are unable to forgive. Lord, I pray that you will speak and you will minister unto us this morning. Be with me, Lord, as I proclaim and declare your word and your children as they receive your word. We come against every work of the enemy. We pray you will open our hearts and minds to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, counselors and emotional therapists tell us how unforgiveness can cause distress and brings issues like depression and insecurity to surface. surface. It has a spiritual, emotional, and even physical effect on us. On us. You know, certain psychosomatic problems like, like migraine and gastric, you know, psychosomatic. Psychologically, you are affected in your mind. Soma, the Greek word for body. Your body begins to express that unresolved issues that you're affected psychologically. Believe it or not, one of Dr. Amanda Rowett's book, A Licensed Medical Health Counselor, published in April 2015, the book, The Prison of Unforgiveness, one of her key points was, unforgiveness spreads like cancer. And I have dealt and prayed with people. Because of unforgiveness, it started with gastric, it turned into ulcer, and by the time the doctors opened up and saw it, it became cancer. It is connected to high blood pressure. Now, this is not my research, but this is what um, Evander Roberts says, tells us. It is connected to blood pressure, weakened immune systems, and even cardiovascular problems. And that's, that's just to name a few. Unforgiveness and bitterness is common and hard to deal with. If you have met certain kind of people in your life, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. Some people have this uncanny gift of just hurting and bringing down others. And it gives them such joy and pleasure when they see others in pain. And they just want to use words that will hurt you. You know, the very thing that will cause hurt in you, and they'll say that very thing. And it's difficult. But the Word of God says that unforgiveness and bitterness is in fact a sin. A sin that defiles us. And the word of God, as we just read from Hebrew, tells us it's like a plant that can take root in us. Thus making it, making it difficult for us to forgive and move on. And many people, many people live through bitterness throughout their life. Even over issues that took place when they were a child or when they were a teenager and even in advanced age and sunset years, they still hold on to the bitterness. Now let's look at the scripture portion that was read to us earlier. Hebrews 12, 14 to 15. Make every effort. Make every effort. You make the effort. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Please underline that word in your Bible. Live in peace with everyone. Whether you like them, you don't like them whether they've caused you pain or they've brought you joy, whether they are a blessing to you or a curse to you. This is not easy. Live with, in peace with everyone. Even sometimes it can be a very selfish, self-centered neighbor or a colleague or a relative. Live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see God. Verse 15. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitterness is like a plant. It's like a tree. It can grow roots in you. And it can, be, and it can take root in your life and become so strong that you cannot let go. You cannot release. You cannot forgive. And when you live, live in bitterness, it's going to defile us. 
make us sinful before God. Some of us may not understand how hard is it to deal with unforgiveness and bitterness. Forgiveness is hard. Almost always, it feels impossible to do because of deep wounds that have that has affected us or ongoing wrongs that people have done to us. And this is a serious issue. Yet the Word of God teaches us that by God's grace, we can surrender. Remember this word, surrender. That means, sorry, I'm not moving it. Why is it moving? Okay. You all aren't doing anything, right? We have to hand over, surrender our anger, our resentment, and learn to forgive give others, just like how Jesus forgives us. Maybe you need to forgive your mother-in-law, or maybe you're not, you, you need to forgive your pastor, or your elder, or your friends from church, or your neighbor, or your boss, or somebody whom you say, I just want to avoid this person. I want to have, if possible, I want to have nothing to do with this person. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. This is what Apostle Paul tells us. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievances, a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I'll read that again. Bear with each other. We need to bear one another. Sometimes you've got to tolerate people. And forgive one another if, you, if any of you has grievances against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now this is, of course, easier said than done. That is because, and this is important. Listen to me very carefully. Until the day we die, until the day we hit the grave, there will be people who will hurt, hurt us. Nobody is going to be immune from this. People who will wrong us. People who will irritate us. People who will be jealous of us. People who will slander us. Because they're going to nothing else better to do. Try to ruin our re reputation. Be vicious towards us. And I can spend the next few hours keep on reminding you of the list of evil that people can do to us. And if you say, I've never been affected by any of this thing, then you must be a really super being. Now, if we do not practice the character of Christ to forgive and move on, then bitterness will begin to brood in us. Although it starts out small, the hurt and offense Borrows a deep into our heart. Then we replay it in our mind. He said that. She said that. He did this. And constantly thinking about it and end up making deep ruts that will be hard to fix. I would like to share with you this morning an apocrypha story. An apocryphal story of a deaconess. Now, there was this lady in the church that served the Lord faithfully throughout her life. And after an old age, she went to be with the Lord. Now, as I told you earlier, it's an apocryphal story. She arrived in the pearly gates of heaven. And she was so happy, so joyful, that she can go, into, go to heaven and see the Lord whom she has been serving throughout her life. Now, as she arrived at the pearly gates of heaven, she was denied entry. She could not enter into heaven. And um, she was unhappy with the angel who stopped her. And then the apostle Peter came, and they were still talking. And she was very angry because she could not enter into heaven. Finally, Jesus came down and began to speak with her and trying to resolve the issue. And she said, Lord, Lord, I served you throughout my life as a deaconess in this church. I taught in Sunday school. I shared your word to many people. I drove people to church. Whenever the pastor is not around, I took the pulpit. I, 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 I served you faithfully, Lord. I, 
I conducted various groups. Why am I now denied entering into heaven? This is terrible. I feel cheated. Jesus looked at her with tear in his eyes. He called her by, by name. He mentioned her by name. And he said, yes, my daughter, you served me throughout your life faithfully. But you know, when your husband came and asked you for forgiveness for what he had done to you, for leaving you and your children and moving with the other woman, when he realized his mistake and he asked you forgiveness, you refused to forgive him. Many times he asked you forgiveness. You refused to forgive him. And you also constantly reminded of your father, your husband's infidelity to your children. You poisoned their hearts and minds and you turned them against him. He died as a very sad man. But he is here with me today. For he repented and he regretted of what he did. Especially when he broke the marriage vow. It broke his heart when I spoke to him. My daughter, in your prayer, you always say this prayer faithfully and you always teach others to say the, say the Lord's Prayer. And you will say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. Isn't that your prayer? I'm a God of justice. You died without resolving this with such deep bitterness. I know what your husband did was wrong. What he did was terrible. It crushed your heart. But he asked you forgiveness. I forgive many of your sins and mistakes. Friends, whether you want to believe this story or not, it's not... Is doesn't matter, but what is important is it is told to illustrate a point. A common habit with people struggling to deal with unforgiveness is retelling the hurt, their hurts literally to everyone who would listen to them, including each sordid detail. By doing this, we garner the sympathy and support of others but it only pushes us further into the furnace of resentment. The second someone mentions the offending person's name, there will be a rise in blood pressure and causing an adrenaline rush. I, I went through this. There was one time, there was somebody in church that I hated, not this church, huh? different church. I hated it. I couldn't tolerate the person. And one day my wife says, so and so is on the phone and immediately my pressure will shoot up. But thank God, the Lord is able to deal with me and heal that area in my life. He was a church elder, a leader that caused a lot of pain, not only for him, but many pastors. Then they look for other reasons. We look for other reasons to dislike the person, even more. Sometimes the reasons are real, but sometimes they are imagined. Regardless if it is real or imagined, every new piece of information that fuels hate adds to the thickness of what many call as a wall of bitterness within. My mother used to tell me a story, you know, when we were growing up. You see, uh, this truly happened in her life. When she was growing up, there was an uncle who was cruel to my grandmother, my mother's mother, very cruel. And as my mother was growing up, her mother or my grandmother used to tell us stories and things that this uncle used to do to them. My grandmother became a widow at a very young age. At, I think at 28 she became a widow. And she had four uh, girls to raise up. My mother was the, the fourth. And it was not easy. But this person was very cruel. And my mother, unrealizing, without knowing, actually had a bitterness to the, towards this uncle whom she never met. Many years later, many years later, when my mom was attending a renewal, revival meeting, in those days, what it's called ALC, Abundant Life Center, and while they were praying, there was a lady there with a 
with, who operates in the gifts of the Spirit, the word of knowledge, told my mother, Sister, the Lord impresses upon me that you have a bitterness towards a member of your family, a relative, and that has wedged a wall between you and God, and that is why you cannot get closer to God. And my mother began to cry and weep and ask, Who? And then the Spirit of God brought to her the words that her mother was telling her. You see, she has not met this uncle, but, but words that were put into her told again and again the cruelty and the horrible thing that uncle had done had built a wall in her, and she could not get close to God. She knew, although she goes to church, something was missing. And on that day when she confessed to God to release that resentment, that wall was broken and she was able to serve the Lord freely. In some cases of issues with unforgiveness and bitterness, people fool themselves into thinking that the problem has no effect on them. This is dangerous because the truth is Anger and resentment have a way of seeping into every area of our being, even to the extent, as I mentioned earlier, causing psychosomatic problems. Resentment is like a beach ball. You all know, you all seen a beach ball, right? No matter how we try to submerge it in the water, it pops up with all its vitality, splashing everyone around us. We have to deal with it. Now, Vermont Avenue Baptist Church once wrote about, a conquer, about, a con, about conquering resentment on their website. They defined resentment in four simple words. The cancer of emotions. If you have your Bibles with you, whether it's digital or you can look at the, um, the PowerPoint. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 22, Jesus tells us, You have heard and it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka or rascal, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. My friends, what is God actually saying here? What is Jesus saying? This is saying, by getting angry with people, we are in danger of the fires of hell. Now, you and I know that anger is a dis display of emotions. We are not vegetables, you know. You go and cut the, the carrot or you cut the beans, it's not going to get angry. But you and I are emotional beings. We can be wounded by words, by actions. And when we see something, we will get angry. Something that we are unhappy about, we will get angry. We are emotional beings. So anger is something natural to us. But do we deserve to be thrown into the fires of hell for being emotional? Now to understand what Jesus is saying, you and I need to use scripture to understand scripture. We also need to use scripture to interpret scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 27, this is what Paul tells us. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Verse 26 tells us, in your anger do not sin. So it is all right to feel angry, it's all right to get angry, but do not go and kick your dog because you're angry. So sometimes we're angry with somebody, the car gets all the abuse. We slam the car door, or we hit the brakes, or we slam on the brakes, or we kick something. Or we hurt other people. If you all read the newspaper recent, just a few days ago, the stepfather, the mother's boyfriend, was angry because the baby was crying and threw the child against the wall. 
unable to control anger. Verse 27 tells us, do not give the devil a foothold. The Greek word for the word foothold is topos. It means a spot. Now, the, the English word topography, that means study of an area, comes from this word, topos, a foothold. Now, if we are not careful, the enemy can take control of this emotion, and what starts as a foothold will become a stronghold in your life. A few years ago, my wife and I had to deal with a young girl who was possessed. And because of bitterness, and we found out when we were praying, one of the area of position was bitter towards was her mother. And we had to ask her to forgive everyone in her family. Only then she was delivered. Anger is a display of our emotions. But what matters is how we respond in that anger. That's why the Lord gives us a practical application. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. You know, we are so angry. The sun has already gone down. The moon has already come up. And we are still brooding in our bed. How could he do that? How could you say that? I will deal with that person. Anger. Holding on to anger is what constitutes sin, hatred, bitterness that defiles us. And you know why we are unable to forgive others or overlook the mistake of others, even how bad, horrible it may be? It is because of pride. That we refuse to forgive a person. How dare he do that to me? How dare they say that about me? They have the audacity to ask me that? I'm not talking about you all, you all are holy people, I'm talking about myself. And why we choose to hold on to bitterness, letting it ripen and full, become full-grown resentment? While it looks like we are unable to forgive, sometimes we need to face the fact that we are just unwilling to forgive. I was praying for an elderly lady once and uh, because she had a lot of issues, a lot of problems and so her son-in-law, who is a medical doctor, told me, can you please pass a pray for my mother-in-law? So I came and I prayed for this wonderful elderly lady but while as I was praying for her, I found it difficult to breathe. Like something was clogged and I, and I told her, and I know when I get that feeling, you know, and I told her, sister, she was, she was almost in the 80s, and I told her, sister, you have so much of bitterness within you. You need to let go. You need to let go. You're already going to meet, your, meet the Lord. And you cannot face the Lord with such bitterness. And then her son-in-law also began to ask her, look, release, forgive and she said, no, no, I cannot forgive. And who should going to forgive? Was her relative. They cheated me off my money. They did this to me. I cannot. I cannot. And we began to pray for her. And finally, she was able to surrender that bitterness to the Lord. There was a man lying in hospital. And um, he was very angry with his brother, younger brother. And he could not forgive his younger brother because there was a family, fam it was a family problem. He accuses his father, of spending all the money educating the younger brother, but not him. So the younger brother, or some of you can identify, you know, you're, you're, you're laughing, okay. So the younger brother is well educated, and uh, he has a better house, and he sells, sends his children abroad for education, but he lived a simple life as a government servant, so he was so angry with his father, and also angry with his brother, because uh, the father uh, gave everything to the younger son. But at the time when they were growing up, when the father had a small income and he couldn't give the best for him, but he was able to provide the best for his brother. He couldn't rejoice with that, but he was so angry with his brother. And they never spoke for many years. A time came when he was lying in hospital. He was sick. And he was in a terrible condition. Doctors had given up hope. So the family members told him, Pa, 
why don't you forgive uncle? He always wants to come and see you. Every Christmas he wants to come by. You, you don't allow him to come and we also cannot see, see him and his family. We want to visit our cousins. He said, okay, okay, call him. So the brother was so happy, younger brother. He came to the hospital ward and both brothers reconciled and they spoke and everything. And he was lying in bed with all the tubes and everything going in him. And after they spoke, they were happy and the younger brother was leaving. Just as the younger brother opened the door to leave the ward, he looked at him and said, Hey, if I come out of this condition, I don't forgive you. Huh? <laughs> you are laughing. But it is terrible. Now, some would say, I will forgive if they apologize. I will forgive if they say sorry. They never apologized. They never said sorry. Why should I forgive? Now, people who speak like this have a problem with their English vocabulary. You know why? The very word forgive comes from two English words, for and give, F-O-R-E, and G-I-V-E. Now, the word for, F-O-R-E, you know, comes from the word before. That means to do or give something in advance before you require it. That's what before means, to do something earlier before it's required. To forgive means is to forgive our offender. So when you put the, both the words together in the English vocabulary, forgive means you forgive the person even before they ask forgiveness or apologize, or even if they choose to forgive you or not, you should already forgive the person. That's what the word forgive means. And Jesus expounds on this principle very clearly in the, par in the parable of the prodigal son. We know when you read the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 20, 21, the father ran to the son and forgave him even before the son asked forgiveness. Luke 15, verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. The son, after being with the pigs, he realized he was going to his father. He began to make his way, walk to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. The word of God says, the father ran to his son, an elderly man, the older one running to the younger, ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. But the point is, the father ran and hugged the son even before the son could say that he regretted what is done. That is the meaning of forgiveness. Forgive someone of their offenses even before they ask forgiveness. Jesus also gives us a practical application in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and, that, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. If you come to offer your gift to God, and you know that someone has an offense against you, or you are against somebody, go and reconcile first before you offer your gift to the altar. This is something very difficult to do. People will come to church and they will not look at each other. Now, this is something my father, my dad taught me many years ago. My father is with the Lord now. But as a young boy, this is something he showed me. Now, I want to tell you something very personal that took place in my family. When I was young, I think about six or seven years old, my father had a younger sister, an aunt in the family. And she got married to someone that we were not happy with. She had converted to another religion and, uh, and left the family. And she, and she was with this person and it was very painful. And what happened, the decision was, everybody decided to cut off ties with her. So ties were severe. I could not talk to my aunt, my brother, his brother. Nobody could speak to her. And it was a terrible time in the family, you know. But 
um, we were together, but he said we had ostracized this person because of what she had done. She had converted and she had married somebody that the family disapproved of. That one particular year, during a Christmas service in a service like this, the pastor in that church that I was attending as a young boy, the pastor, while preaching, it was a Christmas. It was a Christmas service on 25th December. And after his sermon, and you know, in, uh, in that church, the denomination, Christmas service are very important. Holy communion is served. And the pastor, very senior man, is still around in his 80s now, he said, if there is somebody that you're offended with and you have not forgiven them, please forgive them. If not, do not come to the Lord's table. Now, for that Christmas service, my aunt was seated there. Of course, her husband was not there because he was of a different religion, but she was there, sitting all alone. And me and my family, we all were on this side. And my father is a person who never misses communion. He wanted to go and take communion, but he found it very difficult. He sees his sister sitting there, and she also couldn't take communion. It was very awkward, a very awkward situation. And then my father did something very remarkable. He got up. He moved towards where his sister was seated. They have not spoken for many years, but on that Christmas service, he went and forgave her and, said, and hugged her and said, I forgive you. Come back to the family. Both of them on that day together walked to receive communion. And because what my, my father did, that sister came back to Christ again and still serves the Lord and her children, although she was of a different religion. My friends, my father has a brother who's a pastor, and he said, how could you do this? How could you do this at that point of time? But then he also changed. Forgiveness, it's difficult, it, but it is powerful, and it's able to bring people back together. Now, as your pastor and friend, I want to say a few things concerning forgiveness. First, what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not excusing or condoning the wrong that was done. Remember, forgiveness is not excusing or condoning the wrong that was done. Forgiveness is not forgetting or pretending that the wrong never happened. We don't have a, a, a delayed button like the computer, you know, we can just delete everything. Sometimes, even forgiving is not necessary mean reconciling with the person who has wronged you. Because sometimes reconciling is just not advisable. Now, before you all jump, Yoshi, let me explain this to you all. Why sometimes reconciliation is not advised? My wife and I, a few years ago, were counseling a woman who was involved with a married man. She knew that she was used by this man for his lustful desire and pleasure. But he promised her that he would leave his wife and children for her. And she believed him. And it was going on for years. In counseling, we told her, this is never going to happen. He's not going to leave his wife and children for you. After some time, she severed that relationship. And we had to help her to forgive this person who had used her and gave her false hopes and unrealistic promises. But after she had forgiven him, we told her, do not reconcile. Because if she goes back to reconcile with the person, she will definitely fall back into her sinful habit again. So in some cases, reconciliation is not advisable, but we need to forgive. Now, in having said that, what is forgiveness? 
Forgiveness is a decision to let go of resentment and anger towards the person who wronged us. Now, the late Archibald Hart wrote many good books. And one of the books that he wrote, he said, Forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. And that's what it is. Forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Having said that, we also need to know why forgiveness is important. Very quickly. Forgiveness brings healing and peace to our hearts and minds. Forgiveness helps us to move on from the past and build a healthier relationship in the present. Many cannot enjoy the present because they are still in bondage to their past. Forgiveness reflects the love and grace that God has shown us in Christ. My friends, in closing, I want to say this. Forgiveness is a choice. We will be surprised and discovered through the power of God and help of God. Forgiveness somehow comes natural to us to move when we are led by the Spirit of Christ and being set free from the bondage of unforgiveness, hatred, anger, hatred, resentment, and bitterness. Forgiving this way is a choice of the will. In some cases, it is a choice that you and I must make again and again and again. So Peter asked Christ, how many times should I forgive my brother? 77 times. Again and again and again, you and I will need to forgive. Till the day we meet our Lord and Savior face to face, <coughs> excuse me, and stand unashamed before the judgment seat of Christ. Forgiveness, my friends, is ultimately the power of God that is work in us as we rely upon Him and His power. Let's bow our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you at this time. Lord, we pray for the spirit of reconciliation. We pray for forgiveness. Help us to forgive even the most difficult person, brutal person, ungrateful person, persons in our life. Forgiveness is your nature, your character. And as your children to be salt and light on this earth, and for FBC to be an example, please, Lord, help us to be a forgiving church and a forgiving individual. Let us forgive as you forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Raymond, for that message. I'm sure it will pose as a challenge for most of us here. Uh, especially for, I think, most of us as we leave this hall, it means going back to our struggles and then we struggle with unforgiveness and then we struggle with bitterness. But why don't, as a response to what is being heard and how we need to forgive just as Christ forgave us, um, let's all stand first. And as we sing this song, um, we want to sing this song uh, over you and uh, to one another that Christ, um, the power of Christ and His love uh, and the Holy Spirit will empower us uh, to do what He calls us to do, to love those who um, He calls us to love, the people that He has placed in our lives. So we're going to teach you this song which is fairly new to you. Uh, we're going to show you the, how the chorus goes so you can familiarize with it, so you can know the words as well. May you know, sorry, <laughs> may you go in the love of your Father God, may you go in the grace of Christ, may you go in the power of His Spirit now to bring Him glory with your life. Let's sing again. May you go in the love of your Father God, may you go in the grace of Christ. May you go in the power of His Spirit now To bring Him glory with your life As you go, as you go And long, how high and wide, and as 
you leave, may you seek to win the prize To find his death, to be your life May you go in the love of your Father God May you go in the grace of Christ And may you go in the power of the Spirit now To bring him glory with your life His very strength for what's to come And as you leave, may you feel His mighty hand Guiding your steps in the race you run and May you go in the love of your Father God May you go in the grace of Christ May you go in the power of His Spirit now To bring Him glory with your life Show his heart to bless the ones with less, the blind and lost. And as you leave, may you be the light of Christ and show our hope is in the cross. May you go in the love of your Father God. May you go in the grace of Christ. May you go in the power of the Spirit now to bring him glory. Brandon and team for that wonderful song. Friends, after the benediction, the pastor and elders will be here to minister to you those who need to be ministered and be prayed for. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for your divine presence who is here with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The benediction. And now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit continue to be with us, leaders and directors, as we leave the house of God, we leave to serve Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.